The Republican Party is all for the people. Uh, they're, they're all about building up the working class. I am 30 years old and I am trans. It took me a long time to realize that I'm not liberal, that I'm not on the left, that I am in favor of the individual over the group. Um, when people would ask me during the election, why or how could you vote for Trump as a Latina? And I would always say, well, you know, when he says that he's gonna do X, Y, Z for Americans, I include myself in that. Now, I know there are a lot of people out there, I have a lot of good friends that are Democrats and lean left and I love them dearly, but I honestly think that their policies and their views are destructive to our society. I guess I'm more afraid of coming out as a conservative with my friends than I ever was coming out as a gay woman in a mostly conservative um, community. I love being a Republican and I love being a Tea Party. There's no vitriol or hate over here. There's no racism or racist people over here that I have personally came up against. Part one, multiple identities. When Donald Trump was elected president of the mother United States of America in 2016, I became intensely curious about right-wing people. Growing up, I wasn't curious about such people because I did my best to get the fuck away from them as soon as I was capable of doing so. My parents believed the New King James Bible was the literal word of God, that if I ever turned out to be gay, I'd go to hell, and that the earth is 6,000 years old. Throughout my teens, I turned more toward facts and logic because I found that with my parents, I wasn't allowed to ask questions like, why is being gay a sin? Why did God make things the way they are. Shut up and pray, child. In my quest for facts and logic, or whatever, I discovered, like, libraries and books. Then, when I was about 18, this anarchist bookstore popped up near where I was living, in the Bay Area of California, and I started reading books by Noam Chomsky, Howard Zinn, Michael Parenti. My parents' general close-mindedness and abusive authoritarian orientation toward child-rearing led me further and further away from them, and closer to left-wing theories and narratives about why the world is the way it is. The left-wing stuff just kind of made sense and I was allowed to question it. I guess you could say that the left opened me up to... A whole new world. Anyway, by 2016, any ties I had to my own family and anyone with relatively right-wing views were completely severed. And so it was extremely difficult for me to wrap my head around why millions of people voted for Trump. And part of me just kind of thought like, well, f them, right? Like, who cares why these f***ing idiots voted for him? They're just a bunch of deplorables. But the more curious part of me didn't go away. I wanted an actually reasonable explanation beyond deplorables. And I didn't want to just like read other people's opinions online about why Trump voters voted for Trump. I wanted to somehow like get to know Trump supporters and understand them. And since I live in a super liberal city in California, I knew it wouldn't be easy to find any Trump supporters in real life. So I did what any normal person would do and I went on Facebook. It started with me using my real Facebook account with my real name until it became clear this wasn't gonna get me very far. I portrayed myself as such a left-wing nut job that there was gonna be immediate distrust if I tried to join right-wing Facebook groups or make friend requests to like super right-wing people. So I made an alternative account that appeared to be genuinely right-wing. Kind of dishonest, I guess, but it seemed like a pretty good idea at the time. And it was an immediate success. With this new seemingly right-wing account, I got access to libertarian groups, Second Amendment groups, pro-life groups, evangelical Christian groups, Blue Lives Matter groups, QAnon groups, incel and MRA groups, dozens of Trump groups, Republican groups, and of course, alt-right groups. The ones that are really into like ironic frog memes and stuff like that. And it did feel pretty invasive at first because as much as these people vocally mock safe spaces, they do kind of like need their own safe spaces. They have their own language and culture. So for example, images and symbols that make them feel safe include things like bald eagles with American flag backgrounds, Punisher cartoons. Lefties tend to feel safe with words like comrade. These guys feel safe with words like patriot. Over time, my newsfeed was nothing but right-wing memes, comment threads, videos, arguments, and I was able to observe and analyze the information after eventually becoming really desensitized to the stuff that I disagreed with or really disliked. And I should say that, yeah, it was deceptive, for sure. I was using images like bald eagles and American flags and Punisher symbols and sh to gain their trust, and I got into their safe spaces. And I friend requested like thousands of them, and so I technically, quote unquote, made friends with thousands of Trump supporters. But it all felt especially justified after I realized pretty quickly that I was not the only one here who was pretending to be someone I was not. <laughs> Sounds good.
Part 2. Balkanization. As I got further down this weird f***ing rabbit hole, I made some friends online who were doing the same thing I was, more or less, and we joined forces to improve our collective ability to know what the f*** we were looking at online. Because things just got weirder and weirder. Like, for example, we all started noticing really bizarre digital behaviors from a lot of the accounts we were following within conservative Facebook groups. First, a lot of the posts were written in, like, really bad English, which made us suspect that they weren't being written by people whose first language was English. This was really odd because these groups tended to have like pretty xenophobic viewpoints espoused like pretty regularly. The second was this thing where one particular account would prompt group members to say something like Thank you, President Trump. And hundreds of comments would pop up saying exactly that within exact one minute intervals into all hours of the night when people in the US would presumably be asleep. Third, certain accounts linked exclusively to really weird shitty WordPress websites using news media layout templates, but everything was over the top clickbait and fake news. Obama signs executive executive order banning the Pledge of Allegiance in schools nationwide. That particular story had over 2 million engagements. So it wasn't really hard to figure this out, you just had to use something called a Who Is tool where you enter in a website and it shows you the owner of the domain, but we found that most of these websites were owned by people in Macedonia. And this was all when Russiagate was a really hot topic, so since Macedonia is in the Balkans and the Balkans is like kind of close to Russia, we thought, oh man, we're looking at Russian bots. It's f***ing Russian bots! So for a short time, I began kind of sounding like like one of those generic liberals who would claim that online Trump supporters were all just a bunch of f Russian bots. But that faded once I realized it's actually pretty hard to distinguish between things like a real account, a hacked account, which is like a real account that was hacked because it hasn't been used for a while and the password was easy to get or whatever, and automated or bot accounts. And there's like a relatively big variety of these kinds of accounts. So since I realized it's kind of hard to distinguish between what's real and fake, I then realized that I'd actually gotten myself into something totally different from what I initially intended. What I had intended to do was to better understand Trump supporters and the American right. What I ended up doing was just like swimming around in a weird ecosystem of fake shit and I didn't understand it for a while, and in fact, I was just kind of bewildered. Then came along this dude named Jun Cho. Meet Jun, pretty cool guy, he's into guns, plays a lot of video games. He wrote a series of Medium articles on Russian information warfare in 2018, and I do think that Jun's a bit of a genius, although I don't trust the US intelligence community as much as he does. In any case, his writings really helped me understand what I was actually looking at once I found myself in this weird ecosystem of digital influence operations. I'll link June's articles in the description so you can read them yourself, but he breaks down how misinformation, disinformation, and propaganda work online nowadays, both from a psychological and a technological perspective. This phrase in particular has stood out to me ever since I first read it years ago in his series of Medium articles. Fake news is a weapon that works by infecting personal identity. Just say it again. Fake news is a weapon that works by infecting personal identity. The more I studied these digital operations, the more it became clear that the whole thing was about money. Macedonian internet nerds just set up elaborate networks using Facebook's existing design framework to get as much traffic as possible to their websites, which were monetized through advertising revenue. So the more people who clicked their sh fake news stories online, the more money they made. Plus, they obviously had access to botnets, which is a fancy term for like a big network of automated social media accounts, and they programmed these botnets to boost their content into Facebook groups and news feeds by artificially engaging content with likes, comments, and shares. The intention of these complex operations was to create the manufactured appearance of viral content, which then made real people think, oh wow, this has been shared thousands of times, it must be important, I should click on it and share it which further pushed the content around and maximized the Macedonian internet nerds' profits. But I also wondered at this point why all this fake news was targeting American right-wingers and not left-wingers. Then this kind of voice went off in my head like, well, I'm a left-winger and I'm pretty confident that I'm not susceptible to all this fake sh**, right? And right around the time that I started wondering about this, like, was I being influenced in the same way? The US Congress released a ton of content that the Russian Information Warfare Operations Team Internet Research Agency had been using to f with all of us as Americans during the 2016 election cycle. And the thing is, they didn't just target the American right. They also amplified Black Lives Matter content, and Bernie content, and LGBT content. So now I was wrestling with trying to figure out, like, why the Russian military was going out of its way to heavily influence both left and right-wing people within the US, apparently to influence our voting behaviors. And meanwhile, some random 
primitive Macedonian dudes were engaged in similar behavior seemingly just because it was profitable. But then I was also wondering, like, were these Macedonians some sort of outsourced operation that Russia was paying? Was the Republican Party involved? Was the Democratic Party involved? Steve Bannon and the Cambridge Analytica gang? <laughs> This was a bit of a dark time for me in terms of mental health. I was using a fake Facebook account to study other fake Facebook accounts, trying to figure out which accounts were real, and coming up with a bunch of wild conspiracy theories which made no sense to anybody in my actual real life when I tried to explain it to them. So I kept retreating further and further into online engagement with fake sh knowing it was fake, and not really knowing what to think about any of it. Some of this started to make a bit more sense for me after I watched Adam Curtis's documentary Hypernormalization, and in particular, the breakdown of this avant-garde Russian political strategist weirdo named Surkov. Surkov turned Russian politics into a bewildering, constantly changing piece of theater. He used Kremlin money to sponsor all kinds of groups from mass anti-fascist youth organizations to the very opposite, neo-Nazi skinheads. And liberal human rights groups who then attacked the government. Surkov even backed whole political parties that were opposed to President Putin. But the key thing was that Surkov then let it be known that this was what he was doing, which meant that no one was sure what was real or what was fake in modern Russia. As one journalist put it, it's a strategy of power that keeps any opposition constantly confused. A ceaseless shape-shifting that is unstoppable because it is indefinable. And so, while I think that Russia as a nation-state is doing some pretty shady sh** these days, what I learned that what they're doing is just amplifying two sides of a conflict in order to destabilize and control both sides, it sounded kind of like what I know about the history of the CIA. The US military spent an estimated 8 trillion f dollars over the course of about 45 years to win the Cold War, and while most of this was for the nuclear arms race and dozens of proxy wars throughout South America, Asia, and the Middle East to stop the spread of communism, a lot of it was CIA operations intended to collapse the USSR from within. One example was Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty, which were fake radio stations funded by the CIA, running 24 hours a day with like 20 languages of everything they were broadcasting for decades, specifically trying to amplify dissident voices within the USSR. This is Radio Liberty, an independent radio network sponsored and supported by the American Committee for Liberation, a group of private American citizens devoted to aiding the oppressed peoples of the Soviet Union bring about a democratic government in their homeland. Although the station features a variety of programs, news is the staple of its broadcast fare. Uncensored news. And so, day in, day out, Radio Liberty, broadcasting in 18 languages, continues its democratic education for the peoples of the USSR. The US looked for and exploited existing divisions within the USSR along lines such as ethnicity, religion, nationality. Fake news is a weapon that works by infecting personal identity. And financed any group promoting anti-communist sentiments along those lines. The goal was to see where solidarity among people could be broken into smaller pieces. Okay, so you probably noticed a few minutes ago I said part two, balkanization. So why is that? Well, so Macedonia is in the Balkans, so that's easy, right? But the term balkanization refers to a process whereby regions such as nation states break up into smaller units, usually hostile toward each other across ethnic or cultural lines. People used the term balkanization to refer to what happened to basically all of Central and Eastern Europe in the 1980s and 1990s because the USSR broke apart into smaller countries, many of which are now hostile toward each other. Russia, Georgia, Ukraine, Moldova, Belarus. Armenia, Estonia, Latvia, and a few others. And Yugoslavia, which was also like this big federation, they used something called market socialism, which was different than the USSR's model, and they broke up into Serbia, Montenegro, Kosovo, Bosnia, Macedonia, and a few others. So it's almost funny to me now to consider that the US spent trillions of dollars to fight socialism over half a century using propaganda tools like quote-unquote Radio Liberty, and 40 years later, a handful of jaded, nihilistic Macedonian TV 
teenagers are making millions of dollars trolling Americans with websites like USALibertyPress.com. If you want to see how the free market really works, this is the place to come. But this notion of individual liberty and freedom, and defining these things in American terms through decades of propaganda pummeled into these people's heads, making them think of themselves not as a unified proletariat working to usher in a better world by progressing beyond capitalism, and instead making them see themselves as segregated identities who must fight each other endlessly across borders of division. I mean, you gotta wonder what might happen if that set of ideas spreads all over the world instead of communism. What does being black mean to you? And why? why? Why do you want to be black? Well, I think that, you know, sometimes how we feel is more powerful than how we're born. Blackness can be defined as philosophical, cultural, okay. biological. But if you have a problem figuring out whether you're for me or Trump, then you ain't black. Part three, real black people. I walked away from the Democrats because when did it become acceptable to encourage the assassination of the president, call for the physical assault of the president, demand the president's execution, call for the rape and murder of the president's child? When I first discovered the walkaway campaign, it seemed really obvious that the whole thing was an astroturf campaign based on patterned behaviors myself and others were observing within their main Facebook group and the pages that pushed their content. AstroTurf refers to apparently grassroots-based citizen groups or coalitions that are primarily conceived, created, and or funded by corporations, industry trade associations, political interests, or public relations firms. And since the walkaway campaign's primary objective appeared to be to manufacture the appearance of a viral exodus of people away from the Democratic Party to hashtag walk away from it, it also seemed obvious that this was either a direct or indirect Republican Party operation. But journalist Carolyn Orr and a few others pointed out that the walk away hashtag had been heavily amplified by Russian Twitter accounts. So there was that weird ass Russia connection again. Pro-Trump and Russia linked Twitter accounts are posing as ex-Democrats in new astroturfed movement. Hashtag walk away from this deceptive propaganda campaign. And I'd already concluded by the time I discovered walk away that it wasn't helpful to get sucked into Russiagate narratives, but walk Walkaway became intensely important for me in this bizarre journey I couldn't really go back from online, not because of who was behind it and not actually because of it being an obvious influence operations campaign. What made it really important to me was that I watched it go from being an obviously fake campaign to something that was sort of real, and over time I watched it actually reshape my thinking about identity politics entirely. So in the beginning I was genuinely disgusted with the tactics I was watching the Walkaway cyber team use. They were using new numerous hacked accounts, and there are ways to tell a Facebook account is hacked if you like know what to look for. They posted pictures that looked like selfies, they were not just any selfies, like selfies of black people, trans people, gay people, and attached little confessional blurbs about why they were all abandoning the Democratic Party, liberalism, and identity politics, and instead embracing a more American nationalist kind of identity. America first, if you will. It felt like a new level of punching down on minority groups, because I knew that a lot of members of minority groups would see this stuff, and and trust the arguments coming from people like them and then align with these positions. But over time, I watched the walkaway campaign start to attract Facebook accounts which were not hacked, they were not fake, and they were not bots. They were real accounts by real black people, real gay people, real women and trans people, posting actual selfies, writing real hashtag walkaway stories, and eventually posting video testimonies like the handful that I shared at the beginning of this video. As expected, these real posts got tons of engagement within Facebook and elsewhere. And as sick as this all felt, at least I got to feel clever, like I was in the know. Because what an obvious case where fake, fake news, news is a weapon, weapon that works by infecting personal identity. identity. But then I was faced with something really difficult. A fair amount of the content in the walkaway groups turned out to be content created far before the walkaway campaign had ever existed. Viewpoints by black conservatives I'd just never heard of before. Like, I'd literally never heard of such a thing as a black conservative. And my brain kind of went to like, well, these must be Russian bots, like, even though they're obviously, like, real people. Ironically, going along with the liberal mantra of white allies just need to listen to and center marginalized voices, I kind of head-scratchingly started listening to black conservatives. Some time ago, I, I met with a, uh, a well-known TV uh, newsman, and I asked him, why is it that when I look on television and I see what black spokesmen are saying, that I see them saying diametrically the opposite? of what I hear in the black community, what I see in Gallup polls and other polls. 
For example, that blacks in this country uh, support voucher systems two to one. Uh, uh, blacks in this country um, prefer more strict enforcement of crime laws, op are opposed to quota systems in employment or college admission, uh, and have never had a majority in favor of busing. And yet when I look at the TV news, an entirely different world is created before my eyes on that tube. And he said to me, well, we can, uh, we can put Ben Hooks or Jesse Jackson on TV, but we can't put the Gallup poll on TV. So everybody does identity politics. The left does it and the right does it. I think that since coming out as a conservative, the way I play identity politics is this. I'm black, I'm gay, I'm a rock world veteran, I'm all these different things, and they don't matter about my politics because I can be all of these things and still love America. How does an African-American woman from Birmingham, Alabama, with a family background in church and arts, become an academic expert, and more than that, on the Soviet Union? That's why I wanted to write this book. I say in order to know who I am and how I became who I am, you had to know John and Angelina Rice, my parents. And they simply believed that my horizons ought to be limitless. Uh, when I suddenly went home in college and said, Mom and Dad, I want to be a Soviet specialist, they said, well, that's good, dear. You go after it. And so I think it's really a story of uh, not believing that there were limits uh, of race and gender, despite the fact that in Birmingham, Alabama, there were clearly limits of race. Tamir Rice was a black boy of about 12 who was brandishing a toy weapon, and he was shot dead. The exact same thing happened to a boy named Daniel Shaver not long after that. Daniel Shaver was white. Sam DuBose was shot dead by the police driving his car away from a cop. The exact same thing happened, actually a little bit before that, to a white guy named Andrew Thomas. Alton Sterling was a black man who reached into his waistband and reached for his wallet during an altercation with the cops, and the cops shot him dead. That was a grievous event. And the same thing actually happened around the same time to a white guy named Dylan Noble. Alton Sterling made national headlines. None of us heard about Dylan Noble. We support Donald J. Trump! Yes! And we endorse... We endorse Donald, Donald J. Trump! Trump. But I find more often than not, society seems to be more focused on the mean things people say rather than realizing that a utopian society will never exist for as long as free will exists. And if I were to spend my days trying to censor people from saying hurtful things, I wouldn't get anything done and it would probably turn me into a bitch. Bruh. Offensive or hurtful is 100% subjective, which is why it seems like the goalpost for political correctness is always moving. If something offends me, I'd rather suck it up and practice callousing my mind so that way I'm mentally prepared for when something actually traumatic happens. But black Americans, contrary to popular belief, can hold widely diverse and opposing opinions on political issues. Maybe Kanye is a Republican. I mean, he's never referred to himself as such, of course, but he said something about Trump that wasn't severely negative, so he's suddenly the black Paul Ryan. But even if he is, so what? In fact, a 2012 study by Vincent Hutchins and Hakeem Jefferson using data from the American National Election Studies found that 45% of black Americans identify as conservatives. Despite this, however, the Democratic Party typically receives 85 to 95% of the black American vote. The South is the only area for the most part in our country that still firmly believe in God. They are very conservative. Most of them are Republicans. And so the liberals and Democrats don't want that because you got to remember, folks, they're trying to defeat the Christians. They're trying to defeat the Republicans. They're not trying to help us. They're trying to wipe us out so that they can control everything. So my first thoughts were, this must be internalized white supremacy, or these people have just been really brainwashed, or they're being paid a lot of money to say shit. 
that they don't actually agree with. But the underlying assumption in my thoughts was that it's not possible or maybe like not even allowed for black people to hold such views. Johnny Silvercloud wrote a piece last year called The White Anti-Racist Guide to Dealing with Black Conservatives. And his take is that black conservatives serve as promoters of white supremacy and function as an actual trap for white liberals. They're a trap, he argues, because white liberals are expected to focus on their race instead of their arguments, which then positions white liberals as the real racists, which actually helps to bolster conservative and white supremacist arguments. And that's probably a sufficient enough analysis, although I have some critiques of that I won't go into here. But what became clear to me in my process of discovering then really listening to black conservatives for the first time was that in a kind of ironic way, I did have this weird like racist implicit bias problem of assuming that all black people actually do think the exact same thing. So my appreciation for black conservatism to this day isn't that I think their talking points have any particular merit due to like the blackness of the people conveying the talking points, but the existence of black conservatives actually challenges the falsehood of black people being an ideological monolith. I think this is important for three reasons. One, black people are not an ideological monolith. Two, identity groups in general are not ideological monoliths. And three, liberals make a lot of really bad and really stupid arguments rooted within this exact assumption that identity groups are ideological monoliths. I'll elaborate more on what I mean about this in part four. Another thing black conservatives helped me do was see black people and just people in general as more complex than I'd previously thought. Because as it turns out, a gay black man might think universal health care is a good idea and also might think that trans women aren't actually women. A trans woman might think that Muslims shouldn't be allowed to enter the United States and also that we need tighter gun control laws. Somehow I'd been taught for most of my life, especially in the time I spent on a college campus and while living in a college town, that people's identity categories defined the totality of who they were. And I wanted to get into this with my liberal friends, both on and offline, after entering into this territory, but I was actually really afraid because, well, I didn't mention this before, but all my liberal left friends knew me as the white guy who had taken multiple black studies classes in college and led reading groups with other white people with the book called Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria, as somebody who did tons of outreach for a local effort to make ethnic studies mandatory in high schools, and the white ally resume list kind of goes on from there, but the point is that it would have seemed really f***ing outlandish for me to start suddenly questioning identity politics. But what I decided to do instead of questioning liberal and identity politics was I started a sort of art and education project by making a photo album on my real Facebook account with screenshots that I'd taken from the world of right-wing Facebook. I made clear that these were examples of what I had seen and learned about in the roughly six months I'd spent on the so-called other side of the internet, and I just wanted people whose algorithms didn't even let them know this shit existed to suddenly be able to see it and understand it and think about it. At the very least, I argued, if we understand our enemy's way of thinking, as well as the ways that digital influence operations work, we might better understand how to improve our own strategies on how to make the world a better place. A small handful of friends did find this like fascinating or just kind of shocking or disturbing, and they said so, but the loudest voices in my kind of liberal left community, the ones that kind of lead the public shaming brigades in liberal internet world, they argued that simply by displaying these kinds of views, by forcing them into their news feeds, that I was causing them and others like them serious trauma and suffering, that I was doing violence against vulnerable people. And these are the people whose comments always got liked and loved and responded to, and so those comments got boosted into other people's news feeds, and you kind of know what happens from there. And I kind of dissociated from the entire process. I just watched the shallow liberal ideology work its magic through the algorithms without other liberals understanding how the algorithms were actually controlling the conversation from that point forward. And I tried my best not to feel deeply hurt when these people and their followers blocked and unfriended me, but man, that sh really does hurt when you think of such people as being your friend. What happened next was when I'd unplug from the matrix of liberal left Facebook and I'd plug back into the matrix of right wing Facebook, I felt sort of identified with some of the right wingers, almost a sense of camaraderie because I actually kind of understood what they meant by like the so-called tolerant left. But like I said in part one of this video, I like literally fled my own family of origin because they were like, should have been free child, whenever I tried to approach them with any good faith questions about anything. But now it started to feel like that's exactly how liberal were too. So now I felt torn between worlds. Conservatives were obviously wrong, but so were liberals. I was alone. I felt like I had nowhere to go, no family or home to return to. I had no choice but to walk away. Walk away.
Por favor, los que bote prueba de la menia comunista. <laughs> In the Russian military's preeminent journal, which is called Military Thought, In 2014, in a seminal article titled Information Operations on the Battlefield, in that article in 2014, Russian military bragged that if information warfare is going to work, it, quote, must be conducted constantly in peacetime, in the period of threats, and in wartime. If you're going to use information warfare to confuse, demoralize, divide, distract and ultimately defeat a rival country. According to the Russians military doctrine on this subject, you do not just do it in wartime. You have to do it all the time or it doesn't work. When Huffington Post did their dive into how Bernie supporters online got targeted in this Russian attack, they focused in part on a Bernie Sanders Facebook page called Bernie Sanders Lovers. Uh, which says it is based in Burlington, Vermont. It is not based in Burlington, Vermont. It's based in Albania. And nobody who's not from Albania appears to have anything to do with that Bernie Sanders site. But the important thing here is that that Bernie Sanders lovers page run out of Albania, it's still there, still running, still operating, still churning this stuff out now. This is not part of American politics. This is not You know, partisan warfare between Republicans and Democrats. This is international warfare against our country. And it did not end on election day. We are still in it. Putin learned a bunch of lessons from the collapse of the Soviet Union and the 1990s era. And they largely stemmed from the fact that you can defeat an empire through entirely cognitive, cultural Um, means. You don't have to shoot. If you can get hegemony for your worldview, be it neoliberalism, be it something else, then the people will stop listening to their leaders and you could have a color revolution. You could have the collapse of the Soviet Union. When I initially set out to study Trump supporters and the American right sometime in about 2017, I didn't yet know what so-called Russian information warfare was or how it was allegedly influencing what I was observing online. What I was taught, starting with June Cho's Medium series and skimming over a variety of publications by US and NATO military researchers, I came away with the sense that Russia was a kind of powerful, unilateral geopolitical force and that it was like literally at war with the United States, just not using using bombs and missiles and tanks. And so for a while, I believe that this was why Trump was our president and why we'd become so extremely politically divided in America. But let's revisit what I pointed out in part two about the role that Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty played in collapsing the USSR by strategically deploying information, sometimes totally real, usually with some kind of bias, and sometimes just like literally fake news, within populations targeted primarily by their ethnic, cultural, and national identities. The Cold War cost the US over $8 trillion dollars over roughly 50 years. And if we think about this $8 trillion as an actual investment in something, and not just as a sort of defensive reaction to the spread of communism all over the world, what exactly was the US investing in? Well, in a word, capitalism. But there's more to it than that. Because while the Cold War was a narrative sold to Americans from the 1940s to like the early 1990s as a purely moral war, wherein evil communist dictators who were just as bad or worse than Hitler had to be stopped by any means necessary, the $8 trillion dollar investment in stopping communism was also like a really literal business investment that was being made into a certain kind of future. US corporate interests were paving the way toward the creation, deregulation, and control of new and existing global markets. We throw the word neoliberalism around a lot these days to just mean generally like free market capitalism and oftentimes something associated with Democrats I don't like, but it was actually like a whole new ideological framework that was meant to usher in a new world based on a new conceptualization of human freedom. In the old world, governments tried to control their people, fight other governments for power, and engage in endless wars rooted in colonialism, imperialism, fascism, and then communism. But the new 
neoliberal worldview said that we just needed to like cut all that shit out and let supply and demand define human individuality and relationships from here forward. This new way of thinking said that people wouldn't any longer need to identify with particular ideologies or nationalism or anything like that because their pursuit of happiness and freedom would be dictated by the individual choices they made based on simple principles of supply and demand. Neoliberalism was supposed to bring about peace, happiness, and justice for everyone. When Rachel Maddow talks about Russia as a kind of evil global superpower engaged in a relentless and actual war against America, I think she's being honest. In that moment when she talks like that, her personal identity is wrapped up in US nationalism. She trusts her country's military intelligence community, she knows she's one of the good guys who fearlessly fights the bad guys, and she's doing what she gets paid $7 million a year to do, which is deliver the news to the people. But if the US really did win the Cold War, and if neoliberalism really did become like the actual new world order, then the logic of global markets tells us that Rachel Maddow does a lot more than just deliver news. She operates as a very highly paid employee of a very successful multinational corporation which seeks to maximize profits for its shareholders by delivering a product to a targeted audience of consumers and extremely profitable industries fiercely compete for airtime between Maddow's product delivery to maintain advertising space to sell their products to that same consumer market. Information warfare. Maddow is therefore an active participant in a set of processes which were the exact intended outcome of the US winning the Cold War. She's just one example of the kind of returns that were made on that $8 trillion investment. In that sense, Maddow's portrayal of Russia as an evil superpower is a dramatic performance paid for by corporate advertisers to reach a consumer market that, based on market research, would enjoy the product being sold to them and would keep coming back for more. Supply and demand. And this is arguably the exact thing that the Russian military did by paying for Facebook ads in 2016 to deliver a product its target set of audiences would enjoy, which would be measured in really precise levels of consumer engagement like clicks, likes, comments, shares. The mechanisms of consumer market targeting, algorithmic behavioral prediction and control, consumer surveillance, and other increasingly terrifying and creepy elements of our new hyper-normalized social media environment are, in my view, inevitable products of the neoliberal order. These are evolutions of the market logic of mass media, which has just entered into something we called social media. And through the neoliberalization of so much of the world after 1991 and the dissolution of the USSR, especially since the 1990s and early 2000s, which gave rise to a new, unprecedentedly massive global consumer base using a new set of products on something called the internet, it's also no wonder that somebody would start gaming and hacking algorithms within social media to maximize profit for themselves. In the case of Russia, it could be as simple as them hoping to weaken US control over oil markets, such as in Syria, but to me it's also possible that Russia had far less involvement and impact than the US military claims. It could be that a bunch of poor kids throughout former Soviet bloc countries who had become severely impoverished specifically because of the US winning the Cold War were actually doing what the New World Order, neoliberalism, told them to do. To become entrepreneurs, to look for products to sell to consumers on the global market. But with the Russia thing, I think what's most disturbing about it is that we've been talking about it from a position of an ideological lens, which we were all socialized to not actually see as an ideological lens. Here's what I mean. There are ads for Coca-Cola, Nike, iPhones, Prozac, McDonald's, Microsoft, Starbucks, and Walmart on almost every billboard, television, radio, and computer screen in the world. The companies that profit from these ads have more power now than most world governments combined. There's at least 20 years of research on the effects of advertising on human psychology from an individual, societal, and cultural level, and in a phrase, the research says that it really f***s people up. It f***s up kids and their psychological development. It causes disordered eating and self-objectification in women. It causes poor impulse control and hyperactivity amongst kids and teenagers. It makes poor people hate themselves because they can't afford what's being advertised. It makes people more narcissistic and competitive. And the more exposure to this sh people get, the more they support policies that make income inequality worse, which in turn makes any existing social inequalities baked into the culture's economy also worse. So if your culture's got some racism, sexism, transphobia, homophobia, phobia, whatever, the cultural normalization of advertising that preys on people's insecurities and seeks to exploit them for profit ends up oppressing the very people those ads are targeting. No matter how woke the ads appear, and no matter how many diversity trainings the employees at those firms are forced to take in order to keep their jobs. And this is what is called, wait for it, information warfare. 
fake news is a weapon that works by infecting personal identity. So what I think really happened in 2016 is that some kind of people somewhere in the world, maybe in former Soviet bloc countries, but also maybe somewhere else, it's actually pretty hard to tell, use the existing design frameworks of social media, which were modeled off of corporate mass media, to profit from international markets to make a better life for themselves. They did it using methods that the CIA used to dissolve their own economies, which then opened up multinational markets into their part of the world, which previously weren't allowed there for nearly a century. They jumped into these newer digital markets and hacked the algorithms in a way that's similar to how free trade agreements hacked governments and cultures to basically send messages to different parts of American society that those Americans already believed to be true. While Coca-Cola might sell fake news to consumers by making people believe that they'll be happier if they drink more Coke, Macedonian teens sold both black and white nationalists the fantasy of thinking that if they just kept clicking shit on a screen, they might somehow annihilate their enemy and create a better world for themselves. Whoever commanded the botnets were happy with their investment returns, social media companies were happy with their returns, data mining companies were happy with their returns, and consumers of all of these products, such as yourself and myself, who experience nothing but happiness from our addiction to social media, can no longer tell what's real or fake. Fake news is a weapon that But the most dangerous thing I think happened through all this is that although this entire global economic framework that the US installed as part of its $8 trillion investment to kill socialism like forever, a basically socialist presidential candidate came extremely close to becoming president of the United States in 2016. And I think while some people, including myself at various times, downplayed any potential role Russia could have played in boosting Bernie's message and mobilizing his base, I actually think it's totally possible. But what I think the former Soviet bloc trolls did is just amplify anything that the target culture would respond to based on algorithmically tested responses to artificially boosted content. Um, today we're going to talk about throwing shit against the wall and analyzing what sticks. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And Bernie was just one cultural phenomena that the target population aligned with enough to continue generating its own message about Bernie and socialism organically to the point where it's now like a kind of movement that's moved beyond markets. And that's not too dissimilar to what the hashtag walkaway campaign was able to accomplish. When we see that Trump did have a small but significant boost in support from black, Latino, and Asian voters in 2020, despite the liberal assumption that nobody but white people could or would ever support him because he's such a racist, the hashtag walkaway campaign was initially completely fake, but it tapped into something within certain members of minority groups that said, I don't like Democrats, I don't like liberals, and you know what? F identity politics. And so apparently there was a market for that, and there still is. But in the re-emergence of interest in socialist ideas, which are actually able to name the neoliberal moment and ideology that we've all been sort of forced to adopt since the end of the Cold War, there's also been a growing trend to return to class politics strong enough to maybe overcome neoliberal identity politics. And to the dismay of liberals and the wishes of their shareholder masters, much of this vanguard is being led by a totally different kind of hashtag walkaway movement. Using systemic or structural racism obscures an understanding of what is the institutional mechanism of capitalism. So many anti-racist leaders of this period towards the end of their life were beginning to draw anti-capitalist conclusions, including even Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King is a black socialist. He might be familiar with, um, you know, A. Philip Randolph <laughs> might be a black wow. socialist. He's familiar with- We're Dedicated towards uh, building a socialist society from the ground up rather than simply distributing wealth uh, in a way that's broad or requires more servility to the state or to the capitalist class. Or Thinking about how anti-communism is not just sort of a, geo a geopolitics that comes out of the Cold War, but rather is a form, a mode of governance, right, meant to, to preserve and maintain racial capitalism going all the way back to 1917. Coates' like, arguments are so shallow in some ways. They don't really do that deeper level analysis. Like, he's, he's pretty decent on race, but yeah. like, it stops there and there's so much more to the conversation. And another example comes from my grandma who was a pediatric nurse who went on strike with the other nurses in her unit and she said there was no color on the picket line and this was during Jim Crow. And that's how I hashtag walked away from liberalism and got turned into a communist by Russian bots. Thanks for watching. Oh my god I'm so happy to be done with this. Uh, okay patrons. Zero, Superbone Big Dog, Marina Irini, Roland, TK Jun, Worker Guy, Whoop Whoop Dick, or <laughs> Whoop Ditch, Will M, Mikhail Vl Monk, Sam, Zach, Isabel Abdullali, Katie, 
Dreeder, Sweeper, Diane Prado, Brienne, Lauren, Garbage Possum, Space Commune, Ashley Altman, Pablo Ruiz, Ulrich Volker Anderson, Jamie Smith, Labor Kyle, Fiona, Nino Miganishvili, Grossthetics, I don't know how to say that, Jen Garcia, Sahil Shah, Chaotic Capybara, Dirt Knight, Halim Ora, Dude, what happened to you? Super Arjuna Butt, Ace, S. Malfade, Noah, Laura Dale, Brighton Beck, Leo Samalati. That's right, bitches. Singing over Tartar Lamb. You don't even know about Tartar Lamb, do you? This is why you, you motherfuckers are paying me enough to pay for like my gas bills every month. Po Sasso. Po Sasso. Yes. Ivanka Michelle, Ivanka Michelle. Yeah, that's right. One more fancy patron, babies. Fairy tone, fairy tone. Yeah, that's right. Hello babies, where I'm living right now, I can't tell you the address because I can't get doxxed because I'm too much of a fox. It's raining, it's raining, it's raining on our swagger's heart. Hey y'all swagger, I see you out in the crowd. Yeah, when I blink my eyes every single time, it's because of you, 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 you. In this neoliberal hellscape where we can't tell what's real or fake, when we try to cook and we try to f- bake, all we can do is take our butts and shake. I swear God, I swear God. I'll swagger, I'll swagger. Yeah, that's right, Nina. Nina, you're a newer patron, but you're giving me basically 70% of your income, so here's where the, the good stuff comes in. This is pay to play. This is like the Democratic Party. <laughs> this is like the Gates Foundation, y'all. You give me all that Patreon money, and I sing. I sing and dance for you bitches. Nina, Nina, Nina.